Mm -hmm. Dodd Frank says, as we just heard from Sheila Bear, that uh, we can't, we will not, have, we will not bail out going forward in the right. U.S. It simply will not happen. In Europe, it happens all the time, right? It almost never not it happens to my uh, understanding. But Franklin Allen understands and knows Europe uh, better than almost anybody else. The uh, financial system. So, Franklin Allen, I would like you um, to respond to some of the same questions, but give us the view of how this is being seen in Europe and. What can we all learn from the international comparisons and have a system that works internationally? Back to the two major questions of, one, the need uh, for simplification, and two, the need um, to prevent banks from getting to the brink of insolvency, perhaps through leverage controls. Um, and finally, coming back uh, in the US, and I think Sheila Bear referred to this, um, Brown Vitter have put forward legislation that would raise um, the uh, uh, am amount of capital that would lower the leverage ratio. Uh, and it appears that there is some um, uh, movement towards that. <coughs> Could that happen in the US? And then where would that put the US banking system internationally? And could it happen internationally? So let me say, first of all, about leverage ratios as opposed to risk-weighted capital. So. I think leverage ratios are a good idea because it's very difficult to come up with good risk weights. And the classic examples here are the AAA rated mortgages, which turned out to be very risky, but they had zero capital weight. And then it, talking about Europe, the, the uh, sovereign debt, which is also <laughs> zero weighted and turns out to be actually very risky. Um, so I think leverage ratios have a big role to play. Uh, I think it's important that we do have buffers. Um, and I think one of the points that I think is really important is what uh, Sheila finished up on, which is you know, where there are lots of risk out there. And much of the debate is about the private sector taking risks. But I, I think if you look back at the crisis, it started all in the real estate sector, and then there's a question, why did real estate prices go up and then fall in certain areas, 30 40%? And it gets back to the public sector, which is that you know, the Fed had very low interest rates for quite some time, and there were various other kinds of policies that one can point to. Which which, right. and yeah. So there are many of those kinds of things. And um, what Sheila was pointing to in terms of going forward, in terms of quantitative easing, very low interest rates for a long time now. These are all creating tremendous distortions in capital markets. And capital markets aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is giving signals about the future. They're giving signals about what the Fed's doing and what you think the Fed's going to do mm -hmm. next. And this is a big problem because when it means is that at some point we are going to have interest rates go up. And this is nothing we can do about credit risk anymore. This is just yeah. pure market risk. And if it happens quickly, and it may well do, uh, it's going to cause lots of problems across the economy. And then we're in a very different world. And I, I think we still think about financial stability much too much on a bank by bank mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. The real risks are the systemic risks. And those are, to a large extent, created, in my view, by central banks and the public sector. And this rise in interest rates is going to be a good illustration of that. Because what's going to happen if it happens quickly is that the value of many banks' assets is going to go down dramatically. And it's not going to be a question of one bank or two banks. They're all going to be threatened. And this is a big problem right. because then we can't expect the banking sector to pay that out because it, this is a massive proportion of GDP if it all happens together. And uh, leverage ratios are one way to try and stop these catastrophes happening by having the big buffers. And we just don't have enough of a debate about these issues in the public sphere. And I think that it is sort of, that's one of our big problems that's out there. I think we were talking about this at lunch. I think the other big issue is that the industry, for a long time, did a very good job of capturing regulators. <laughs> and, and they're not used to making serious arguments about what their positions are. So the current issue is, you know, what, so the, the argument against leverage ratios, which are a kind of level of 15 to 20 percent, is that equity capital is costly. And if you 
make us do it, we're going to cut down on lending and the world's going to end. And the, the problem is, we, we, when you ask them, well, why is equity capital costly, then it, you get into a, a, you don't really get into an argument. They can say, oh, well, you know, we have to make a return on equity of the current rate. But if you have bigger capital buffers, then the people on the other side say, no, you know, it's Medigliani Miller, you don't need to make that kind of return, and so it isn't costly, and then we get into these big things. And it, they haven't really put a, a coherent argument other than things like tax subsidies and so on, which we could talk about, which you should stop tax, su subsidizing uh, debt and guaranteeing debt, all those kinds of things. But we need to have a sensible debate about why equity capital is costly, and so far the industry hasn't come up with good justification for why that is.